uh, that good reminder to us of just how important it is to put our words into actions, especially when it comes to protecting our environment. Now we head to the more temperate waters, thank you very much, off the coast of West Africa. Here in Nigeria, we meet some scientists who are working to turn what has been a problem to our waterways to something good. Paper. Yes, they are looking and they have found a way to turn water hyacinth and indeed seaweed into paper. And they say this would save our trees. Nigeria spends the equivalent of 1 million euros every year on imported paper products. Apart from this, the world's forests are being destroyed as trees are cut down to extract cellulose, the basic raw material for making paper. Scientists at Mountaintop University in southwest Nigeria are doing research in order to find an alternative. They believe that the water hyacinths can make a difference. Chemist Nell Indukwe is leading a group of scientists at the university on the project to explore the usefulness of this water plant that covers many waterways and lakes around the country. They want to produce paper from these plants, usually considered a pest and a major nuisance to the use of waterways around the area. It's a viable alternative to producing pulp, uh, fibers for paper making and other uh, materials that could be obtained from that bio resources. Water plants are known to absorb larger quantities of carbon dioxide than land plants, and the process by which pulp is produced from them is far more environmentally friendly than the process of making wood pulp. The stems of the water hyacinth are made up of about 65% pulp-making fibre. The leaves and flowers contain only 25%. The harvest is laid out to dry in order to remove the water before the pulping process starts. When dry, the fibre is cut into pieces and then cooked with sodium hydroxide in order to make it easier to extract the fibres. The fibre is then rinsed with fresh water to remove the chemical residue and non-cellulose matter from the plant. The fiber is bleached with hydrogen peroxide, whereas wood pulp is bleached six or seven times. Water hyacinth pulp needs to be bleached just twice to clear out the colored compounds. The material is then blended to make a pulp slurry, a semi-liquid mixture. And after that, you start with the paper formation. That is exciting. <laughs> The pop slurry is poured into a vat. Next, sheets are pulled out using a mold and decal. You see what is happening there? You can see all those things, they are bonding. Starch cannot do this thing. After they will just click. The paper we have made, um, we could use it for packaging like the unbleached craft pop. You can see. The unbleached craft pulp is like cotton. Just roll the paper if you want to make it in large quantity. While the bleached one, uh, you can use it for uh, new sprints based on the, the additives to increase the strength properties and the tensile properties. We consume a lot of papers. For example, writing papers, writing notes, writing reports and we buy a lot of this paper. Once we start producing, and it's of standard, and we use it, of course, we will use our own first, you know, to experiment, and then buying will be reduced. Since trees take such a long time to grow, experts call hyacinth the material for the future. The process is sustainable, and it presents no conflict with tropical rainforests, because these plants grow in water, and as they grow, they photosynthesize and remove carbon from the environment. The researchers of Mountaintop University are hoping to scale up soon.
Oyster farming is a centuries-old practice and conditions along the Gambia's coastline are ideal for it. But there comes a point when too much is too much and it starts to have a negative impact on the environment. And the mangroves there have a good example of that. They are very important as a breeding ground for small fish and also for carbon storage. So an initiative is training the oyster farmers there to use more sustainable methods to ensure that the mangroves are better protected. The mangrove forests in northwestern Gambia are a major factor in the battle against climate change. Their roots store five times more carbon dioxide than other types of rainforest. Wild oysters grow on their roots. Harvesting them provides women with a source of income, but in the past, the mangroves were damaged in the process. After the shellfish are steamed and the shells opened, they're ready to be sold. During the four months of harvesting season, I might earn up to 50 euros a day. I'll pay the rent on my house for the rest of the year, the school fees for my kids, and I'll put some aside. A can of oysters sells for the equivalent of about 50 cents. But even though oyster farming provides women with a livelihood, it's also contributed to the degradation of the mangrove forests. And that's impacted the local ecosystem because the mangroves provide a breeding ground for fish. Katang is a town on Gambia's west coast. Fatu Jana is a fashion designer and an activist. She campaigns for mangrove forest conservation. For the last 10 years, she's also organized workshops designed to improve the lives of Gambia's female oyster harvesters. So I came in to just to see how I can help them so they can improve their lives and improve their, the, the environment also. Because the environment is important here for us because they've been chopping the mangroves and taking the oysters. So I believe that um, that has a great impact on the climate change in the Gambia. One simple alteration to the harvesting system makes a huge difference. If the women collect the oysters at low tide, they don't need to chop off the roots. We know that if we continue cutting the roots of the mangroves, there'll come a time when there are no more oysters to harvest. Anyone who hacks the roots of the mangroves is penalized. The oyster farmers are organized and have regulations to follow. The women are also starting to rely less on wild oysters. This is an improvised oyster farm. It's a project that sees oysters grown on racks rather than mangrove roots. It takes a year for them to mature. These oyster aquacultures have improved working conditions for women from 15 villages in the area. If farming changed our way of harvesting, it stops us from paddling far away and it also gives chance to the fish that lay eggs. It reduces also our, our, our this day, tiredness. They take a long trip by the day trying to get the, 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 the oysters. So, and some of them have drowned here before. Some of them have, 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 have a pregnant woman. We lost a pregnant woman one time. Accidents are now a thing of the past. The women have even begun planting new mangroves. Everything you see I planted myself. Now they've all grown big. Thanks to Fato, we now know how to conserve and protect mangroves. Fatu Jana's organization has trained around a thousand women in sustainable oyster harvesting techniques. Their standard of living has improved, and the delicate mangrove ecosystem is thriving. Our last report today takes us to the coast of South Africa. The beaches are known for their breathtaking beauty, but people are people. And despite the strict rules and regulations, litter is still a major problem. Thankfully, there are organizations out there that are focused on responsible management of the coastal environment, like the blue flag. But they, in turn, would be lost without the many volunteers that ensure their missions are accomplished. Is the beach clean? Yeah, it is clean. So that will also be thrown off. Thrown off, <laughs> okay. 
four and a half out of five. Not bad. The stewards are asking beachgoers around Plettenberg Bay to rate how clean the beaches are. We've got a visitor survey, which we do ask visitors that are on the beach. It's got like time, dates and location. So um, it gives exactly the location where we're at and, and then we just rate from, five, from one to five what they think about the beach, the um, visibility of signage, the toilets. The two young, unemployed women come from nearby black townships and are part of a group of nine volunteers who care for the beaches here. A local NGO employs 200 young people in three coastal provinces on behalf of the Tourism Blue Flag project. The stewards get nine euros a day for their efforts. The role of these stewards is to ensure that um, the beach goers as well as the municipality, they comply to the blue flag criteria and also pass on information through the environmental education activities that they do with the beach goers as well as school kids. As well as checking the beaches, the Blue Flag program keeps tabs on ecotourism boats in the area. Today, the stewards are on board the Oceanic Express, which takes tourists to the seal colony nearby. Have you done this before? These Cape fur seals had disappeared from the area in the 1800s as a result of uncontrolled hunting. But due to successful conservation efforts, more than 6,000 now populate the Roberg Peninsula. Can just open it for me? We also check uh, if they're actually complying with the code of conduct in terms of how they, uh, they approach the seals, keeping a safe distance and also not taking fresh photography. Back at the beach, the stewards have involved local children in a clean-up campaign. Environmental education is one of the pillars of the Blue Flag program and many schools participate. Most of the litter collected by volunteers is plastic. A study has been conducted which showed that most of the plastic is actually locally produced like this one. And the problem is that the, the public is not informed about the, uh, the waste and that the municipality at our recycling stations at Blue Flag Beaches, they don't separate the waste, that, but they mush it back together. The campaign to keep the beaches clean is a never-ending one. The project is scheduled to run for almost a year, but the stewards hope it will be extended. The money they earn, combined with the satisfaction of helping to protect the environment, make it a rewarding experience. Now, just another example of how much we can accomplish if we all do our bit. Thank you for joining us for today's edition of Ecod Africa, a co-production of Channels Television, Kwese TV and Deutsche Welle. And to you, our viewers, do be sure to write us and let us know what you think and share your ideas as well. The addresses will be showing at the credits. I'm Neil Taigbe signing out from Lagos, Nigeria. Bye-bye. <laughs>